good evening guys uh, so we'll deal with the neat ss cardiology recall uh, so the thing is i've just analyzed the question paper there were a lot of questions on ecg so around seven questions were from ecg around three questions from clinical cardiology so that's basically uh, a large chunk of your paper 60% of your paper is straight away from ecg and clinic and uh, clinical cardiology so again it uh, stresses the emphasis that you have to put in on the basics so uh, for me the question paper was not very difficult around 18 questions were asked and i think they were pretty simple questions questions which we had mostly covered in our uh, discussions so again it's a bit by i am a bit biased because you know from me being a cardiologist those questions appear to be easier but uh, we have to think at think of it from your point of view also you have to study a lot of subjects and uh, cardiology is just one part of the uh, neat ss cardio paper so let's go for the questions so question 1 which is which is uh, the only which is which is the iv only so which is the only class 3 antiarrhythmic given only iv with potassium blocking properties that blocks late inward sodium current so here they asked you two things they have asked you the only iv preparation here and it should be a potassium blocker as well as a sodium channel blocker so again uh, there's no need to think about all the mechanisms so first of all uh, ranlazine is not a class 3 agent and it's only available as orally so ranlazine is out okay i'm not sure whether it's dronidron or amiodarone so dronidron is a basically an oral preparation amiodarone is available as you know both in oral or iv so again so those are the options are out sotlor is available orally as well as as an iv agent so the answer is ibutylate second so which is the old, which is the class 3 antiarrhythmic given only iv with potassium blocking properties and sodium channel blocking properties Ranlazine is an oral agent. It's not class three. Dronidron is a class three, but it's only oral. Amiodron is available orally in IV. Sotlol is available orally in IV. IV. The answer is ibutylate. So again, this is your uh, typical classification, your one million classification. So again, some people have a confusion as whether ranlazine is an anti-arrhythmic because we commonly know it is an anti-anginal. But again, this was my slide from my discussions. The first slide was ranlazine anti-anginal plus anti-arrhythmic. So again, from my slides, it inhibits the sodium current, inhibits the potassium current, inhibits the calcium current. Okay. So again, note it has anti-arrhythmic properties also. So we have discussed this. So the question two is aortic regurgitation is least likely associated with Marfan's aortic dissection, ankylosing spondylitis, and SLE. So again, it's a pretty simple question. The answer is SLE. Okay. So. Uh, Again, Marfan's IT dissection and ankylosing spondylitis. How do they cause IT regurgitation? It causes by root dilation. So again, this was our discussion. So, aortic regurgitation can be of two types. It can be a valvulopathy. That is, there is some problem in the valve. So here you can see it's a valvulopathy. There's a problem with the valve, or it can be an aortopathy. So the valve is intrinsically normal. It's just that you can see that the aorta here is stretched. The aorta itself has become bigger. So your leaflets aortic valve leaflets also get stretched out and you have the development of an aortic regurgitation so that's how it is so you have a valvulopathy something like rheumatic fever rheumatic heart disease bicuspidantic valve which involves the valve per se or you can have an aortopathy that is the valve is structurally normal but it's just that the aorta enlarges your proximal ascending aorta enlarges your valve leaflets get stretched apart and you have the development of an aortic regurgitation so again so these are basically aortopathies, the first three, and SLE does not cause AR. So again, this is how we have discussed congenital. You have a bicuspid aortic valve or a quadricuspid aortic valve. So at this play, at this situation, I discussed. If you have the more than the lesser the number of cusps, the more likely you are to have a stenotic valve. So one cusp, two cusp, more likely for stenosis. The more the number of cusps, the more likely regurgitation. So four cusps is basically a regurgitant valve. Again, different types of valvulopathy, iatrogenic, VSD with AR. Again, we've discussed how VSD produces AR. In a subiotic VSD, it's lack of support. In a supplementary VSD, is basically hemodynamic. Subiotic stenosis, and again, all your causes of iatropathy. And here at this point, why have I marked IOT dissection as in, in green? The reason is IOT dissection, whenever you have a chest pain, when you have severe chest pain, and you have the development of an AR murmur, always think of aortic uh, dissection. Again, why SOV aneurysm? SOV is sinus of valsalva aneurysm. So when you have a uh, aortic regurgitation with a right heart failure, you think of uh, sinus of valsalva aneurysms. So please remember that uh, the development of right heart failure is a terminal event in the 
natural history of AR. So early onset right heart failure, think sinus of valsalva aneurysms. Again, we have already discussed this. You can see all the other etiologies. Syphilis is one thing which I especially discussed. Again, it's very simple that you just remember which are the causes which causes dilated aortic root. SLA does not cause a dilated aortic root. SLA is what is what valvulopathy is associated with SLE? It's mitral stenosis. So again, this is what we have discussed. This is the screenshot. You can see chest pain with AR, think IT dissection. AR with the onset of right heart failure, early right heart failure, think rupture of sinus or valsalva. All these are very important. So again, SLE is associated with mitral stenosis. This is something which I already discussed. So again, just think the causes of iotopathy. So question three, a healthy adult with a history of sudden cardiac death took an ECG and underwent a normal echo and a TMT. He has no history of cardiovascular disease. What could be the ECG finding? So they're basically asking you uh, the causes of sudden cardiac death with a structurally normal heart. Again, so the first option is RBV. Second is RBV with an epsilon wave. Third is an RBV with ST elevation in V1 and V2. And four is LV dysfunction. So again, you're given a normal echo. So straight away LV dysfunction is out. Okay. RBV with an epsilon wave. So they are intending ARVD. Okay, here you expect abnormalities in the echo. See, you might miss a abnormality in the echo in ARVD. Okay, if you don't, unless you closely look at the RV. So whenever we do the echo, we generally ignore the RV. All our attention is focused on the LV. So you might miss it. But again, you have to carefully look at the RV, the RV apex in order to see features of ARVD. So again, normal echo is mentioned. So we need not bother about uh, AR, AR, RBB with the epsilon waves. So R, R, plain RBB, why should we associate with sudden cardiac death? The answer is RBB with ST elevation in V1 and V2. So what does this indicate? This indicates Brugada syndrome. So again, RBB with ST elevation V1 and V2. So Brugada syndrome. So remember, the Brugada syndrome is associated with a structurally normal heart. Okay, so again, this was from my uh, slides. So. You can see that uh, in the jungles of Thailand, there is the fear of a fiam or a widow ghost who comes to steal the souls of young men. So this uh, widow ghost comes and sits on the faces of uh, young men in the primes of their life, suffocating them, causing agonal respiration and death. Some men defend themselves from the fiam by wearing lipstick at night. So the ghost mistakes them and leaves them alone. So again, this, this you can see. So in the young, these, these are seen in young males, so around 40. So testosterone plays a very important role. Males to female ratio of eight is to one. It's seen in Southeast Asia, events occurring during sleep and rest, and the commonest cause of death is a polymorphic VT. So you can see the story. So young males, death during sleeping, okay. And uh, especially they are it's due to a polymorphic VT. So again, all this is suggestive of Brugada syndrome. So again, it's a right bundle branch block with a persistent ST elevation in V1 and V2. So again, the three types of Brugada, only type 1 is clinically important. Type 2 and type 3, unless they convert to a type 1, it's not very relevant. So again, it clearly indicates a Brugada syndrome. So if I have any doubts, you kindly please post them in the chat box and we'll answer them. So the next question on ECG, true statement on ECG. J-point elevation can be physiological and can be pathologically seen in hypothermia. U waves are seen in tachycardia. T wave is only LA depolarization. T wave is atrial depolarization. So the answer is A. So again, I'll come to that. U waves are seen in bradycardia. So please remember that. And when you have bradycardia, your U waves become more prominent, especially in your mid precordial leads, V2 to V4. So U waves are more commonly seen in bradycardia. Can you name another condition where U waves are prominent? It's basically in hypokalemia. So hypokalemia, you have uh, a very prominent U waves and you look for U waves in the mid precordial leads. And the, where do you get U wave inversion? Okay, U wave inversion in the presence of chest pain is very suggestive of an LAD stenosis. So the left anterior descending being stenosed is, is commonly associated with a U wave inversion in the presence of chest pain. So P wave is only LAD polarization. This is false. It's composed of both RA as well as LAD polarization. So a very important point. The first half is right atrial. The second half is left atrial. T wave is atrial depolarization. That's false. Okay. P, P wave is related to atrial depolarization. So nothing to do with the atrium, the T wave. The answer is J point can be physiologically, yes, and pathologically seen in hypothermia. 
So again, we've all we have discussed the causes of uh, J waves. So hypothermia, hypercalcemia, brain injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cardiopulmonary arrest, vasospastic angina, and idiopathic ventricular fibrillation. So we have discussed all this. We have discussed the J wave syndromes, Brugada and ERPS. So we have discussed all of this. Next question was identify this ECG abnormality. Again, again, it's a, another question on ECG. This was a two is to one AV block. So again, you can see a P wave here, the non-conducted P wave here, the conducted P wave here, the non-conducted P wave here, and so on and so forth. Okay, so a very standard, straightforward question. This is a two is to one AV block. Okay, let me just confuse you a bit. Could you have a look at this ECG and could you tell me what is the rhythm here? Okay, I'll give, I can just uh, type out your answers in the chat box if possible. Okay, so I'll come to this. This is not a two is to an AV block. So it's very important for you to know. This is the conducted beat. This is the non-conducted beat. This is the conducted beat. You can see the non-conducted beat, conducted beat, non-conducted beat. Okay, so why is this not a two is to an AV block? Okay. So in a two is to one AV block, this is originating from the SA node. So this P wave morphology, the conducted P wave morphology is exactly similar to the non-conducted P wave morphology because it originates from the same place. And also the P wave is expected to come at its normal location. So whenever the, the P wave is expected to come, it comes at that place. So you can see this gap is the same as this gap, which will be the same as this gap, which will be the same as this gap. So Again, it's not a premature beat. This is a premature atrial complex. So you can see here, again, it's difficult to uh, say whether this is the morphology of the P wave, but this is definitely a premature P wave. So you can see, uh, let's say here, this interval is narrow. This interval is wide. Okay, so this impulse is a premature impulse. Okay, so this is a premature atrial complex, which is non-conducted. So this is atrial bigemini. okay where the second beat is non-conducted. So very important. This is your closest differential diagnosis for a two is to one AV block and it has great significance. Why? Because a two is to one AV block is a higher degree of AV block. It can be suprahisian, can be infrahisian. We consider that to be infrahisian. So it has a serious uh, pathology. This is a relatively benign condition. You can just leave it alone. So always, whenever you see a two is to one AV block, always think, could it be an atrial by Germany? with the second P wave being non-conducted. Again, look for the morphology of the P wave as well as whether it's premature or not. So again, this is, this is not for an exam case. This is a case which was referred for dizziness, referred for a, as a sick sinus syndrome and was advised a pacemaker. Here again, this is the conducted P wave here. This is the non-conducted P wave here, the conducted P wave here, the non-conducted P wave here. This case was misdiagnosed to be a two is to one AV block, where actually it was atrial bigemini. Again, nothing needed to be done for this patient. So question number six, patient with ACS, ECG is given, all of the following are two except. Okay, so what is this ECG first? We'll just come to this. This is an inferior wall plus RVMI with a posterior wall MI, all right? Again, the ECG is exactly not accurate, but uh, I think, uh, the concept is enough. So this is an inferior wall plus why? Because you can see ST elevation in the inferior leads. Posterior wall because you can see ST depression here. And when you see an isoelectric complex here or even minimal ST elevation, you start thinking of an RVMI. Again, you have the supportive evidence here showing ST elevation in the right side leads. So this is an inferior wall plus posterior wall plus RVMI. Okay. And uh, again, so how do you manage this? So primary PCI, yes. Thrombolysis, yes. Antiplatelets, yes. You should not restrict fluids. Okay, as a general rule in RVMI, you have to aggressively reperfuse this. I mean, uh, volume resuscitate these patients. So these patients are the patients where you give boluses of IV fluids. So why do you give IV fluids in RVMI? There is no, uh, not, uh, the less volume is coming in the right ventricle. So there is no less of the preload. To increase the preload only, uh, we give a fluid so that uh, we should have a good uh, uh, stroke volume. So how do how does the stroke volume increase? So you give uh, a right lot of fluid. Ventricle, 
right ventricle will get uh, more of the uh, blood and yeah. then only it can be it can be pumped to the pulmonary artery so you are artery. saying that the right ventricle will contract right increases. ventricle uh, the preload yeah. should increase yeah you are saying that the preload will increase and the right ventricle will increase its force of contraction according to starling's law right yeah okay but again the right ventricle is infarcted no it is ischemic how will it increase its contraction you got my point yeah yeah See, this is the common wrong answer which is being, uh, I don't know, it is being taught to PGs as well as many people have this wrong conception. You give a lot of fluids, the RV gets stretched and the RV increases its contraction and it pushes blood into the pulmonary artery. But again, the RV is ischemic. Okay, please remember the right ventricle. Okay, I'll just draw this here. So this is the PA here. Okay, your PA pressure is 25 by 10. Okay, the RA is here. The RV is here, your RA pressure is something like 0 to 5, your RV pressure is something like 25 by 0 to 5, right? The yeah. RV is ischemic. It's very difficult for it to increase its force of contraction. So when you give lot of fluids, your RA is the one which is going to stretch. Please remember your RA stretches, your RA increases its force of contraction. And remember, PA pressure is very low. So this increase in this RA can now pump, increase its force of contraction, and pump it into the PA. So it is the RA which is actually mm. distending, the RA which is actually contracting and pushing blood into the PA. So please remember that. Okay, the mm. RV is ischemic. So it is the RA which is going to increase its force of contraction. Remember, PA is a low pressure circuit. It's not valid for the aorta. Okay, aorta is a high pressure circuit. So the PA is a low pressure circuit. The RA pumps, the RA pushes blood into the PA by increasing its contraction. Okay. So, which group of patients present with hypotension in an RVMI? So, you have understood why do you give fluids in RVMI? So, when does this not work? So, you're giving fluid, fluid after fluid, but the patient's the BP does not pick up. So, which group of patients present with uh, hypotension in these patients? Okay, it is when the RA does not work. So, one, if the patient has an, uh, if the patient has atrial fibrillation, the RA does not pump. Again, remember, RV is gone, RA is also gone this patient has profound hypotension. That is why when you see these patients in inferior wall with an RVMI, you, if the patient is an AF, his BP is going to be very low. Okay. So unless you correct that, the BP does not improve. So one is atrial fibrillation where the RA does not contract. Two is when you have uh, junctional rhythms or complete heart block where there is dyssynchrony between the RA and RV. So the RA is pumping against a closed tricuspid valve. Okay. And uh, so I've already taught you this. And, uh, and atrial infarction. So again, along with the RA, RV, the atrium is also infarcted. So the atrial branches also arise from the proximal RC. So I've taught all of you this. Okay, so you give IV fluids in an inferior wall with an RVMI so as to distend the RA and increase RA contraction. When the RA does not work, you get hypotension in these patients. So atrial infarctions, atrial fibrillation, junctional rhythm, CHB. In these group of patients, probably your IV fluids do not work. Okay, there is one more cause. Again, it's a bit complicated. I have to mention that in the videos. So, you know, for the interest of time, I'll just avoid it. If there is interest, I'll tell you at the end of the uh, uh, presentation. Okay, so please remember this, very practically important. You give IV fluids to distend the RA. Which factors cause RVMI not to respond to IV fluids? It's when the RA does not work. Okay, so again, junctional rhythm, Okay, so the, again, hypotension, atrial fibrillation, hypotension, complete heart block. So the atrium contracts independently, the ventricle contracts independently. Again, this is expected to be in hypotension. Okay, so very important point. And this is often taught wrongly. Okay, you have, people get their concepts wrong. I find this RV the distension to be a very common answer among PGs. So question seven, which of the following ECG manifestations of dyselectrolytemia are false? Hypocalcemia causes a prolonged QT. Hypomagnesemia causes shortened QT. Hypokalemia causes flat T waves with U waves. Hyperkalemia causes T waves. Okay, uh, it's a pretty straightforward answer. Okay, hypocalcemia causes a prolonged QT. That is true. Hypomagnesemia causes a shortened QT. That is false. Okay, I've told you all your hypos cause a long QT. So hypocalcemia causes a long QT, hypokalemia causes a long QT, hypermagnesemia causes a long QT, hypoglycemia, even hypoglycemia causes a long QT. Hypokalemia causes flat T waves with the U waves. This is also true. Again, remember it's the Q U interval which is prolonged. Hyperkalemia causes tall T waves. This is true. 
the answer is hypokalemia causes a uh, hypocalcemia. I mean, sorry, hypo uh, which of the following is false is basically hypomagnesemia causes short term QT. That is the false answer. So this is the answer which is false. Hypomagnesemia causes short term QT. So I'll ask uh, the candidates a question. Okay, which electrolyte abnormality does not cause ECG manifestations? Can you, would anyone like to try? It's a very simple question. Would uh, if anyone would like to try, please uh, we can unmute you. Which ECG manifest? Which ECG? Which electrolyte does not cause ECG manifestation? Sodium. So why? Why does sodium does not cause all the other electrolyte abnormalities cause? So why does sodium? You don't find ECG abnormalities. You have books don't mention hyponatremia and hyponatremia as a cause. Can anyone tell me why? I would have mentioned. Hypophosphatemia. Yeah. Okay, I'll just come to that. Okay. See, uh, for that, yeah. For that, you need to understand that repolarization is a much more vulnerable phase than depolarization. Okay, so this is, so please understand this is, this is repolarization and this is depolarization. So repolarization is a much more vulnerable phase than depolarization. Okay, when you, when you have depolarization, it's basically a single sodium channel opening and closing. So you have a single channel, it opens, there is depolarization, it closes, there is repolarization. Okay, in repolarization, you have a calcium channel here. Okay, you have a potassium channel here. You have different types of potassium channel here. You have another different type of potassium channel here. So multiple channels which are opening and closing. So depolarization, single channel which is opening, single channel which is closing. In repolarization, multiple channels open and close at different intervals. That is why things can go wrong in repolarization. Okay, because of the complexity of repolarization. So you look at all your ECG changes. Okay, STEMI, in STEMI, they are T inversion, T becoming upright, ST depression, ST elevation. Again, repolarization changes. Erectolyte abnormalities, repolarization changes. Kamosha cordis, repolarization changes. Post cardiac arrest, repolarization changes. Intracranial abnormalities like uh, bleeds and strokes, repolarization changes. When they become severe, they can spill over into depolarization. For example, hyperkalemia initially involves your ST and T waves and then spills over to the P and QRS complex. So again, repolarization is a much more vulnerable phenomenon. All your ECG pathologies are mostly in repolarization because things can go wrong in repolarization. Again, sodium is in depolarization. It's, that's why hyponatremia and hypernatremia don't have any ECG changes. Because again, it's a single channel opening and closing. It's not a very complex thing. Okay. Is that point clear? I guess that's clear. Okay. So remember this. You have calcium channels here. Okay. You have potassium channels in repolarization. Magnesium handles calcium and uh, potassium. That's why hypo, cal, hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hypercalemia, hypo magnesemia, hypermagnesemia, they cause ECG changes. So calcium and potassium are in repolarization. Magnesium handles those. So abnormalities of those electrolytes can cause ECG changes. So sine wave appearance seen in, again, nothing much to say. It is in hyperkalemia. So hyperkalemia is described as a syphilis of all of uh, e electrocardiogram. Okay, yeah. because, yeah. Hyperkalemia is described as a syphilis of electrocardiogram because of the varying manifestations of hyperkalemia. Anything can be seen in hyperkalemia. You can have bundle branch block, you can have bradyarrhythmia, you can have tachyarrhythmia, you can have uh, VF, you can have a sinus standstill. All of this have been described in hyperkalemia. Okay, so again, what is the sine wave? Sine wave is basically a geometric waveform that oscillates up and down. So you can see this here. Around the baseline, it oscillates up and down. And that's how the hyperkalemia ECG mimics. So again, this is a case which I think uh, you can see the date here. It presented to me on June 1. Okay, so this was a patient uh, who was in our ICU. So the duty doctor calls me uh, saying that uh, this patient was brought in with severe chest pain. Okay. And uh, there's no available history, no relevant history. So it was brought with severe chest pain. So again, uh, he, he thought it might be a cardiac abnormality. So he sent me this ECG and he said the next ECG was taken 15 minutes later and he noticed ST elevation in V1 and V2. All right. And uh, would anyone like to try this? What is this? You can see all sorts of ECG abnormalities here. Okay. So this is basically hyperkalemia. Okay. Hyperkalemia causing a broadening of the QRS complex. 
And within half an hour, this was what happened here, or this is the strip taken. This is your sine wave pattern. Okay. So this was basically the, it was, the chest pain was uremic pericarditis. Okay. So you can see as the potassium, as the potassium levels increase, the QRS complex becomes broader and broader. And typically you develop ST elevations in V1 and V2. And then you can have your typical sine wave pattern. So again, calcium gluconate is essential for these patients. Okay. So remember, hyperkalemia causes an abnormal shortening of the uh, repolarization and, and an abnormal lengthening of depolarization. So with that, you can describe your ECG abnormalities. Again, myxomatous degeneration of mitral valve, Carpentier classification. Again, a pretty simple one. It's type 2. Okay, this is what I've taught you, Carpentier classification. I've told you only one thing. MVPMR comes under type 2. Okay. So this is basically a surgeon's classification, depending on how it's uh, how easily they can repair the mitral valve. So that's why I told you. I've only told you one thing. MVPMR comes under type 2, and usually they ask those questions. All of the following can cause AV block except HIV, diphtheria, limes, and chagas. The answer is HIV. Again, it has been taught to you. This was a question I discussed. Fluctuating complete heart block is seen in Whipple, diphtheria, Lyme, and Chagas. Again, the options are also the same. Okay. So uh, please, this is all except. Okay. So remember that uh, Lyme, diphtheria, and Chagas are usually can be associated with an AV blocks. So diphtheria is a pre terminal event. So when you see complete heart block in diphtheria, it's usually the patient is in shock. He has multi organ dysfunction. The patient is going to die. Okay. Lyme disease is one disease which is common, which can be seen, especially in. Uh, all these hilly areas and mountainous and uh, forest areas, okay, where you have it's basically multi system disease. One of, it causes Lyme myocarditis, and one of the manifestations of Lyme myocarditis is complete heart block or varying degrees of heart block. Chagas, again, you can be associated with an apical aneurysm as well as heart blocks, again, seen in South America. So, again, this was under myocarditis where we discussed this. Myocarditis with heart block, think Lyme, diphtheria, and Chagas. Again, the same options were repeated. So myocarditis with heart block, think Lyme, diphtheria, and Chagas. Clinical findings suggest of severe AS. So paradoxical split or single S2, that's the answer. Again, not a very difficult question. I think uh, these are the questions which I've been discussing since MBBS. Okay. So again, for my slides, okay, the signs of severe AS. Again, this was it. Mild, mild AS, you have a normal split. Moderate AS, you have a single split, and severe AS, you have a reverse or paradoxical split. Okay, so these were the uh, severe, this was how severity of AS was discussed. So again, what happens basically is you have a prolongation of ejection time. So this ejection time actually increases. Okay, so there's a stenotic orifice. The ventricle takes a longer time to eject blood across that stenotic orifice. So all all of the signs which correspond to severity actually reflect the prolongation of the ejection type. So remember the word prolongation of ejection type. Okay. That is manifested as a long late peaking murmur. So there is more time for ejection. So you have a longer late peaking murmur, which what you auscultate. You can palpate as a heaving apex beat. Again, longer time for ejection. And you can palpate as a pulses power cicadas. So low volume, slow rising pulse. All these three basically indicate longer ejection. The A2P2 reversal or the paradoxical split also indicates a increase in ejection time. So LV ejection time is increased and all those pulses, power, cicadas, heaving apex, longer late peaking murmur, paradoxical split, all of that indicates severity. Question 12, JVP finding in severe TR. Again, it's just basically a CV wave. There's no question on that. Okay, so see, I've discussed uh, uh, J four things in JVP. Okay, if you get a prominent positive wave, think myocardial disease. If you get a prominent negative wave, think pericardial disease. A very important point. Prominent positive waves, a prominent A wave, or you think of tricuspid stenosis, or uh, or you can see a can, or you can think of, so you can see a prominent negative waves, like a prominent X descent or a prominent Y descent. You start thinking of constrictive pericarditis and tamponade and all those. So prominent positive waves, think myocardial disease. Prominent negative waves think pericardial disease. Okay. Four diseases you need to know from JVP. Okay. What are the JVP, JVP findings of constrictive pericarditis? Prominent X descent, prominent Y descent. What are the JVP findings of cardiac tampon? Prominent X descent, absent Y. Okay. So that's very important, the absent Y. What are the JVP findings of TR? So we have the absent X descent, 
and we have the absent expression with a prominent CV wave. And the next question, what are the JP findings of TS, which is basically a prolonged Y descent. Okay. So four JP findings. No JP findings of CCP, cardiac tamponade, PR, and TS. All of this have been discussed. Okay. So you can see the CV wave or the venous corrigan. It's called the venous corrigan or Lancy's C sign. So why what is X descent? So A, A wave is basically atrial contraction. So atrium is contracting, the pressure in the atria is increasing. X wave is descent is basically atrial relaxation. So your uh, atria is relaxing, the pressure is falling. So what happens when you have tricuspid regurgitation? The jet of TR is pushed into the atria. So from the right ventricle, you have a jet expansile jet of tricuspid regurgitation entering into the RA, increasing the pressure. The pressure really does not fall and you, it straight away goes into the CV wave. Okay, so straight away goes into the V wave. So the TR increases the pressure in the RA and it prevents the fall of pressure. And that's why the X descent gets obliterated and it straight away goes in for a V wave. It's called a CV wave, the Lancy C sign or venous corrigan. Again, this can be in severe TR, everything, your venous pressure is increased. If you have prominences of veins in your arm, you can see this expansile pulsation in your ambience also. JP finding in TS, again, it's a prolonged Y descent. All of this have been described. So again, this is me discussing the prolonged Y descent in uh, TS. Okay, so why does TS have a prolonged Y descent? Y descent is basically atrial empty. So when you have a tight stenosis here, it takes a longer time for atrial emptying. And that's why you get a prolonged Y descent in TS. So again, normally you have TS, you have the prolonged Y descent because of delay in atrial emptying. You have the obliterated X descent or the CV wave in TR. So remember the four, four diseases where you need to know the JAPR, cardiac tamponade, constrictive pericarditis, TS and TR are most common. Also, it will be useful if you know the cause of uh, Karen A waves also. Again, nothing to say. Patient presents with pansystolic murmur in the left parasternal region with systolic pulsations over the liver. The answer is severe TR. And remember, in the exams, there are three causes of liver pulsations with respect to cardiology. TR produces systolic liver pulsations. TS produces diastolic liver pulsations, or what you say, pre-systolic. And AR produces systolic liver pulsations. Okay. So there are various named signs in AR. This is one of them. Okay. Again, AR, you should have a very prominent EDM, not a pansystolic murmur. Question 15, known case of hypertension and diabetes, history of MI who has undergone PCI, he has CKD, EGFR not too bad on enlapril, aspirin, atorvastatin. Which drug has a cardioprotective effect? Okay, so they're basically giving you diabetic drugs and ask you which drug has a cardioprotective effect. So it should have some cardiovascular benefit. Okay, so uh, very important point for you to know. Okay. The answer is very clear, it's empagliflozin. Okay, I've told you that if you get an option where you have an SGLT2 inhibitor, invariably that is going to be the answer. Okay, so when you deal with diabetic drugs, you ask two questions. Which drug is cardiovascular safe? Which drug has cardiovascular benefit? Okay, so safety is different from benefit. You need to establish neutrality only in safety. But when you talk about benefit, you need to, expect, you need to have a positive result. Okay. So you can see here the trials in of uh, OHAs in diabetes. Okay. In 2008, your trials have rapidly increased. So up till 2008, your trials are very slow, small numbers. But from 2008, there's a rapid expansion in trials. So what happened in 2008? Can anyone say? So students, can anyone of you say what happened in 2008 so that... Uh, this, the number of trials were rapidly increased. Anyone? Okay, so in 2008, you had this coming in. So rosiglitazone increased risk of MI and stroke. Okay, I mean MI and sudden and death. So rosiglitazone actually increased the risk of myocardial infarction. Death. Rosiglitazone was a wonderful uh, oral hypoglycemic agent, decreased HPA1C, decreased blood sugars, minimal side effects, except the patient had risk of MI, okay? And again, it was taken off the market. So from then, this, was, this came out in 2007. So from 2008, the number of trials rapidly increased. So which drugs are cardiovascular safe? All of the drugs available in the market right now are cardiovascular safe. It is only possible for a diabetic drug to come out if cardiovascular safety has been demonstrated. 
you need not demonstrate cardiovascular benefit you just need to demonstrate cardiovascular safety so all the drugs available right now are cardiovascular safe cardiovascular benefit is a different question there are only two drugs they are sglt2 inhibitors and glp1 agonists okay not all but certain glp1 agonists and again that's the answer was empagliflozin this is the ada standards of medical care for cardiac patients so if the patient is at high risk of ascvd or has ascvd heart failure or dkd it's either sglt2 inhibitor or a glp1 receptor antagonist if it's not controlled you can combine both this is the esc 2019 again it's sglt2 or glp1 receptor antagonist agonist so again sglt2 inhibitor has shown benefit across the entire spectrum so if the patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease has risk factors ckd and heart failure well glp analogs have, are neutral in heart failure so sglt2 inhibitor benefit across the entire spectrum glp1 agonist like liraglutide has benefit semaglutide has benefit across acvd risk factors and ckd not heart failure that's why the answer for this is empagliflozin so sglt2 inhibitors are the new kid on the block if you see a option uh, with uh, an sglt2 inhibitor invariably it's an sglt2 inhibitor So, six question sixteen. Anticoagulant of choice in patients undergoing PCA with a prior history of HIT. Okay, I'm not sure about the options, but uh, bivalvulin was there, and that's the answer. Okay, so bivalvulin is the answer. So, what are the? You cannot give heparin or uh, lower molecular weight heparin if the patient has HIT. Heparin is thrombocytopenia. So, your drugs of choice are usually your directly acting thrombin and thromb thrombin inhibitors. So, your DTIs. Okay, so which can be. Um, argotraban lepiridin danaparoid and bivalvulin okay fonda paranax has been used off label okay it's not recommended but people have been using it off label okay but fonda paranax should not be used for a patient who is undergoing any intervention whether it's angiogram angioplasty whatever because of a high risk of catheter thrombosis again that's an mcq for you in the cath lab we do not use fonda paranax alone okay because of the high risk of catheter thrombosis Okay, so our preferred agent in the cath lab is UFH. Okay, some labs use low molecular weight, but we most of labs in India use UFH. Okay, if the patient has heparin induced thrombocytopenia, remember use a DTI, which can be argotraban, uh, lepiridin, danaparoid, or bivalvulin. So please remember that. Again, question number seventeen. They gave you an ECG, and uh, what was it? This was a right bundle branch block with a left anterior hemi block. So you can see the. right bundle branch block here you can see the slurred s wave in the lateral leads and you can see the left axis deviation starting with the q you can see a small q in one and avl with a left axis deviation this is lafd okay it's difficult to write here so it's lafb plus rbb so this is a bifascicular block so it's left anterior hemi block with a right bundle branch block So can anyone say is this a standard combination? So is LAFP and RBB commonly seen? All right. So yes, LAFP. Sir. Yeah. We are common. I think we are having transmission difficulties. I'll just finish the answer. It's a commonly seen bifascicular block. Okay. The reason is this. The right. This is from Balthasar. Okay. The left anterior fascicle and the right bundle are on adjacent sides of the ventricular. Uh, Again, I think there's transmission difficulties. I'm not able to hear you. So they are seen on adjacent sides of the ventricular septum. So any septal pathology can affect the left anterior fascicle as well as the right bundle branch together. All right. So question number eighteen. Which of the following is correct regarding MR and AS? So systolic stress is proportional to LV pressure and ventricular diameter. Eccentric hypertrophy in AS, concentric hypertrophy in MR. Okay. So AS has a concentric hypertrophy, MR has an eccentric hypertrophy. The answer: systolic stress is proportional to LV pressure and ventricular diameter. This is as per the Laplace's law. We have discussed this. So you can see LV wall stress is proportional is equal to LV pressure into radius by two into LV thickness. So you can see the LV wall stress is directly proportional to the pressure and radius. So again, this has been discussed uh, in the chapter of aortic regurgitation. In fact, you can describe a lot of valvular heart disease, AR, AS, with 
laplaces law okay so with this we come to the uh, end if anyone has any doubts we can uh, go forward with this so if any i think there are a lot of questions in the chat box i'll just take it up okay so again this was intended as a teaching session so that's why i told you a lot of things okay it's not just not coming in merely telling you the answer is this the answer is this okay you would have probably guessed the answer in most cases okay so let's see the questions so uh, was there sudden cardiac death in question 3 okay this is one recall again this is a recall question so again uh, was there again uh, you guys should tell me actually so the recall i got was there was sudden cardiac death in question 3 it actually makes sense okay st elevation echo shows rwma in us obviously if the patient has st elevation you you in where you usually have a regional wall motion abnormality okay again if the st elevation due to pericarditis you might not have it but if it is due to a myocardial pathology then generally you have a regional wall motion abnormality so please repeat last ecg okay i'll just come back to that so increased ra action ra is preload dependent to maintain bp so please repeat the first five questions at the end i think this will be available to you on the app uh, so you can have a look at that so hypernatremia can you please give a recap after the end of the class i think this will be available on the app you can have a look at it okay so sir question number 9 at the end of the session it i'd be nice to know how many questions out of 18 most people got correct so the question was one one guy said asymptomatic elderly male with no family history of sudden cardiac death okay with some ecg abnormality with normal echo and tmp what is the diagnosis okay again uh, why was this why would you frame a question such a way that there's no family history with some with uh, normal echo and tmt again this was the question i got so let's see how it is okay please repeat first five questions okay i think uh, sudden cardiac death was not there all right so many people are saying the sudden cardiac death was not there okay so i'll just go back to the question once more healthy adult if uh, no sudden took an ecg underwent a normal echo and tmt okay see so it's basically a normal person so a healthy adult with no history of uh, sudden cardiac death had a normal echo had a normal tmt again why do you do a tmt for a normal person i have no idea no history of cardiovascular disease again then it could either be rbb or rb with epsilon waves but if an elderly adult was mentioned probably i would go for rbb again it depends on your question okay so again remember structurally normal heart you can have a right bundle branch block burgada also has a right bundle branch i mean uh, has a structurally normal heart So again, you can still have RB with ST elevation in V1 and V2. But remember, ARVD has is a, has structural abnormalities of the RV, LV dysfunction. Obviously, your EF or there'll be at least diastolic dysfunction. So it's either A or C. Okay, depending on uh, uh, what it is. If it's mentioned an elderly adult, I would probably go for plain RBB. If it's just mentioned a healthy adult, it can either be RBB or RB with ST elevation V1 and V2. Okay, I think that question has a lot of controversy. So it was mentioned ECG showed some abnormalities, and thus echo was advised. Anyway, I think uh, that question is difficult to answer without knowing the question as a whole. Okay, severe valvular AS. Fourth option was an ejection flick. Okay, thank you for your input. But uh, again, the answer is still paradoxical split. So, are there any further questions? okay so i think there are no further questions so there are no further questions if uh, anyone would like to ask a question directly probably we can uh, turn on the mic for them if not i think we can close the session so one can just raise their hand or uh, dr yeah. pran hello yeah hello, sir yeah tell me uh, yes yeah, just uh, regarding that question sir uh, type 3 uh, class 3 anti arrhythmic with the yeah. sodium channel blocking property with the which is only given as intravenous dose yeah uh, i missed out sir uh, what was the answer you mentioned sir the answer was ibutylate actually so ranlazine is oral and it's not a class 3 agent yes sir. i'm not sure whether dronidaron was asked or amidron so dronidaron is oral amidron was there sir yes sir yeah so dronidaron is oral okay and uh, the fourth option was uh, I think sotlol sotlol is given orally as well as IV. Okay, so again, sir. so only IV is basically ibutylate. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you, doctor.
Or if anybody else has questions, please raise your hand. Okay. So I think there are no more questions. Sure. So I think uh, we can close the session. So Vaishnav, we can put the closing comments. Thank you guys for attending this uh, session. So I hope this was uh, informative for you. Remember, it's just not merely learning the answers that counts. So you need to learn the concepts also. So whether you answer, whether it's neat SS, whether it's INSS or whether it's some other competitive exam, always knowing the concepts helps and it'll always stand you in good stead. So thank you guys. Thank you for joining this session and uh, may God bless you. Thank you.